been traveling the world since 1947. I think it's about 74 years now. That year is shortly after the ending of World War II, and that's significant because you recall about Our Lady of Fatima, she appeared during the First World War. They called that First World War the Great War. And it was very common to say about that Great War, it's going to be the war that would end all wars. Right? And that's, that phrase is in our history books, we said so, so often. But Our Lady told those children something quite different. She said, this war will end, but if people do not reform their lives, a second and more devastating war will come. And we know in hindsight how accurate those words were. That's why we now call those wars World War I and World War II, and they're not that far apart. You know, uh, World War I ended in 1918. 20 years later, turmoil growing up here in, uh, in Europe by you know, about 20 years, one, one generation, probably one generation later, uh, Second World War. Our Lady was very accurate, along with so many other things that she prophesied about the world and following that second, more devastating war and the development of those things, particularly about Russia. Russia would spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars, persecutions of the church, the good would be martyred, the Holy Father would have much to suffer. So after that, all the development of the world of these things, the idea came to have this image made, send her out and over. Let people know everywhere she would go with what she said in 1917. But it's not just, you know, that message is not just, you know, like a new message. It didn't start in 1917. Of course, there's prophecies that are new, but what mainly what she said is the gospel message. And she highlights something of the power that we've been given by the grace of God through the sacraments to bring peace in this world. Or if we neglect it, to allow the world to grow into ever greater corruption and confusion, turmoils, wars, persecutions. And so, following that second more devastating war, we got together with an artist before he went to work on this image. She told him exactly how our lady appeared. And when Lucia saw this image completed, and she got to spend an entire night with this statue in her cloistered convent cell. She's crying like them. After that night, she said that this is the best life of St. Mary that she has ever seen. But she continued, but nothing can really compare to how beautiful Our Lady truly is. And we know that. We, we know that as beautiful as this carved image of Mary is, it, it fails in comparison with that wondrous vision that stood before those three children. And Lucia tries to convey for us what she saw in that, you know, those afternoons in uh, 1917. She said, you would have to imagine a crystal goblet, fill it with the purest water, and have the brightest rays of the sun shine through that goblet. What would happen? Well, you know, that goblet, it, you know, just radiate beams of light that would just shimmer in all directions. And, and those children were absolutely convinced that that light that was radiating from her. It wasn't just some heavenly ornamentation of beauty that God bestowed upon her. They said that light itself was God. God himself radiating from her. They became convinced of this at a very important and precise moment in that first apparition, May 13, 1917, that moment came after Our Lady asked those three children a very heavy question. She asked them, are you willing to offer yourselves to God and to accept all the sufferings God intends to send you to save souls, make reparation for sin to God? Those children said, yes, we are willing. They wanted to obey anything the beautiful lady said. Yes, we are willing. And Our Lady said, then, we will have much to suffer, but the grace of God will be your comfort. And Lucia said, when she said that second phrase, the grace of God will be your comfort, she opened up her hands like this. Now, we've all seen images of Mary like this, right? We call that image Our Lady of Grace. Well, 
you'll see is that when she opened up her hands like this, the light that was already radiating from her shot like beams from the palms of her hands. Those beams penetrated the hearts of the three children. They fell to their knees and they prayed simultaneously this prayer, which we see is that it just welled up within them, coming like an impulse from that light. O oh, most holy trinity, I adore you. My God, my God, I love you in the most blessed sacrament. Now, we know that prayer is not directed to our lady. Right? She's standing right before them, but they seem to become oblivious to the wondrous vision that's right before their eyes. And enraptured with the content of that light that's forcing through them. We know this because that prayer that they prayed that acknowledges God in the most profound mysteries that He has revealed to us about Himself and handed down to us in His Church. The first, a mystery of all mysteries, the Holy Trinity. God is one in God, but three persons Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And He has taken upon Himself our human nature, the incarnation, so that He might communicate His own nature with us, His divine life with us, in the sacrament. Most especially the Blessed Sacrament, the Eucharist. Now, one month later, Our Lady appears again as she promised those children. By this time, Lucia, especially, is suffering a great deal. It's, it's primarily because of the apparitions. Lucia's mother does not believe that what she is saying, she thinks she's making up a story, trying to get attention like some children might. And so her mother's punishing her. Quite severely. Her mother even tries to force her to confess to the priest that what she is saying is a lie. She drags her see it down to go see the priest. You tell him this is a big lie. Of course, the see it couldn't. She just told the priest what happened. But her mother's opinion shapes the opinion of her whole family, all of her siblings. So for this entire month, that 10 year old girl is feeling very alone in her own home. If anybody says anything to her, they make fun of her. And she was, she was the, uh, you know, the youngest in the family. She was used to being noted upon. And they would dress her up and have her dance on the table. Now, she, if they say anything to her, you know, they're, they're making fun of her, trying to bring her back to her senses. So when Our Lady appears the second time, after having promised back in May that she would one day take all three of them to heaven, to see a Basically, makes it known that she's ready to go now. <laughs> One month of suffering is pretty good. Of course, she doesn't say that, but she says, Will you take us to heaven now? Our Lady's response to her does not console her at all. Francisco and Jacinta will be with me soon. But Lucia, God wishes you to remain for a while longer to make me known and loved. Because God intends to establish in the world. Devotion to my immaculate heart. We know from Lucia's response to this calling that she's not at all excited about it. I'm going to stay here all alone. I ready very gently. No, my daughter. Do you suffer much? I will never abandon you. My immaculate heart will be your refuge and the way that will lead you to God. Well, already in these first two apparitions, I can pretty much summarize the, the foundation of the message of that. There, there are four more apparitions, and they're important. And you get in July, the, the big secrets, the, the prophecies. In August, the children get arrested. And the, the magistrate tries to force them to confess what is the secrets, and they can use even to the breadth of death. They said, okay, we're going to take Lucia, she'll be boiled in oil. And they're threatened that they did not give in. In October, they, the great miracle of the sun, everybody, 70,000 people at least witnessed this great miracle. But the, the main part of the message is already there. That first apparition, that any question that our lady asked those three children, Lucia later confessed that she had no idea what she was getting into when she said yes. But she also later confessed that what she said yes to, it's nothing extra. 
she matured in her faith as she grew long life and understood her faith well as she went on to the convent and all this. And when, see, when we were, we should just later refer to that question as our baptismal duty. Because when we were baptized, it was into the life of Christ, the life of self-offering. Are you willing to offer yourself to God? Accept all the sufferings God intends to send you to save souls, make reparation for sin to God. Well, that's what Jesus did on the cross, offering himself, his great act of love and mercy for us, and on our behalf, reparation for our sins to the Heavenly Father. He calls all of us who believe in him and have been baptized to reciprocate, to do the same in gratitude. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, that's the English translation of the Greek word. Eucharist. To gratefully enter into holy communion with our Lord's own holy sacrifice upon the altar, on the cross, offering ourselves in union with Him. Now, to call us the common priesthood, which is what it is, is we baptize priests, prophets, and kings. The priesthood part is exactly this. To call it the common priesthood is not to say that this is something that's easy or even something that's commonly fulfilled. Well, the, the church is well aware this is something quite extraordinary, something even heroic. And when you know, the church examines the life of somebody you know, for canonization, they're looking for that heroic virtue. Did they live a life of heroic virtue? Well, that heroic virtue bears witness to supernatural grace, something that's given to us to help us overcome our own fallen natural tendency to fear suffering to worry about the future. And we might freely abandon ourselves in complete trust to God's will for our lives. I think it's especially for this reason that every time our lady appeared at that moment, she didn't ask the children to do this other thing. She repeatedly told them, pray the rosary every day. She said that in May, like in June, like in July, like in August, September, Finally, in October. In fact, in October, she didn't just repeat those words. She, you know, all season long, she never told the children who she was. They, of course, they asked her. Everybody wanted to know. Our lady's response was, in October, I'll tell you who I am and what I want. Well, after this season long build-up, with all the anticipation, among all those titles that our lady could use to identify, Among all of these titles, she says, I am the lady of the rosary. Have them, us, pray the rosary every day to bring an end to this war, and the soldiers will soon come home. What is, there, what is it about this little devotion? It's about 20 minutes. If I make it a habit, I pray every day it's so powerful that it can end wars. And terrorism, bringing peace to homes and families, communities, peace between nations, and ultimately, in the end, as she promised, an era of peace, a great time of peace, will be granted to the whole world. What happens when we pray the rosary? I think the best answer is given in St. Luke's Gospel, because there are more than one occasion St. Luke describes the heart of Mary. She's raising her son. She's observing the events that are taking place and hearing the conversations. St. Luke says that she treasured all of these things. She pondered them in her heart. And what do we, when we're praying the rosary, we're meditating upon the mysteries. We call them mysteries, but you could just as well call them the most significant events of the gospel, the lives of Jesus and Mary. St. John Paul II, he said when we pray the rosary, we enter into the school of Mary. We learn to treasure those things she treasured, ponder on those things she pondered. And what is she not going to be able to do for us in those intimate moments that, she, that we spend with her, 20 minutes a day? And that's the way she actually referred to it. She even told us the other keep me company while meditating upon the mysteries. Keep me company. That's even like referring to it as like we're consoling her. We're actually consoling her heart by 
just thinking about these meditations. Why? Because that is her heart. That's the treasury of her heart. We draw near to her heart as we ponder these things with her. What did Lucia, what did she tell Lucia in the depths of her suffering? She said, my back the heart will become for you a refuge and the way that will lead you to God. What is a refuge? That's a pretty strong word. That's, that's like a torture a place I can go to and hide and find protection and comfort and consolation. And the way that will lead you to God. These intimate 20 minutes a day that we spend with her, she's going to obtain for us all the graces that we need to become ever more faithful to what her son described as a rocky, narrow path that leads to eternal life. To take up our cross each day and follow after him. Or to be willing, as she asked, to be willing to accept all the sufferings God intends to send us in order to save souls make reparation to God for sin. This has been dubbed God's peace plan from heaven. We can see it didn't start in 1917. It's the same one that he proclaimed 2,000 years ago. But it, it does highlight something of the power of the intercession of Mary. St. Louis de Montfort said three centuries ago, true devotion to Mary is the surest, the shortest, the quickest, the most perfect of means to holiness. We see this confirmed at Fatima, one century ago. By this means, God is going to bring peace to this world and salvation to souls. So it's a great privilege to, to be made for this message to be some of the few people that are here to, to, to hear it aloud, to, to cultivate us, and invigorate us, encourage us. Just continue, I know. You know, I'm speaking to the choir, but it helps to be to be encouraged. I hear that to know this is this is really the way forward. In fact, she, she actually told the children, you know, but before they knew who she was, they she talked about herself in the third person, and she said, "Pray to Our Lady the Rosary because only she can help you. Only she can help you. Think about that. I mean, it, you know, it's it's so easy to try and find things in the world that we can put our faith in and trust in." Only she can help. Now, of course, uh, our Lord can help us too, but she's the one that helps us get on our knees right here at the foot of the cross, where she is, always inviting every man to bring ourselves. And she's going to obtain the. the you know, we, we speak about our Lord, the, the, the sacramental graces that come from our Lord. But, you know, to, to get to that, to get to the sacraments, we need grace just to get us. We, we really go through the power that we have, the free will, it, it's primarily uh, a power to basically ascend, right, to, to, the, to the will of God. We, we have the power to accept the grace. We can reject the grace, or we can accept the grace, but we can't go beyond the grace, right? We need, we need grace to bring us to the grace, and it's just, it's just a, a flow of, of love, which is God himself, God's life in us, moving us. And correcting us. So that's what she wants to do for the whole world. That's how she's going to bring the whole world back to her heart, to her son's heart. And you know, it's it's high time we more and more people began trying to uh, lose our faith in everything else and put our faith in her. Um, I think we have a little bit of time. I, we are going to be processing about ten minutes into the. And uh, and then there's going to be a lot of public go through there. But if you have any questions now, I can just respond to you in a few minutes. Yes.
star and down near her shin. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, there's a few, few ideas, and I think the best is given uh, the book of Esther, the name Esther, the star. Well, if you look, if you read the book of Esther, it's, there's this Jewish queen uh, that saves her people from destruction. And so if you combine those two symbols, Our Lady is concerned to save the whole world from self destruction. Yes? Yeah, that necklace. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the, the golden ball, the golden globe. Yes. One more Yes. Go ahead. Um, this one miraculously shed tears, right? What year was that? Yeah, mostly 1972. There were other cases, but that was the most uh, renowned. It, it just kept on happening, church after church down in New Orleans. And, 1970 to the summer of 1970. And uh, so much so that the Archbishop of New Orleans uh, decided to open an investigation and had the tears tested. They, drew, they proved to be truly human tears by people who did not know what they were examining. Uh, but uh, there was also photos taken of it. It became internationally known. Now, it was only later that people were surmising you know, what, why was she weeping so much, so profusely. And maybe one of the best answers given that during that same period, in, uh, the Supreme Court was debating the decision uh, about what we were And so we, we didn't know the conclusion of that until January of 73. She, of course, said she did. No, she, we, I, I've been to other countries with her. Uh, Brazil, Lithuania, Mexico, Ireland, Poland. How special is that? <laughs> it is very special, yeah. Um, some, sometimes, especially if you get into the third world, like my first time I've been a few times with her to Guam, the very first time in Guam, which is actually U.S. territory. It's like traveling to America, but it's people on it's the other side of the world and on the island. And you know, you can imagine you're, you're coming, you get, you're just getting off the airplane into an airport, and all of a sudden there's a bunch of people, yay, love your beard! And they right, right there, and there's probably 200 people there just waiting. And, and then we had like a police escort from one church to the other. The whole, the whole island just came alive for it. It is a very